Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. You know, if you've been to this website, you know we do the McLaren P1, the F1. We do all kinds of high-performance Z06 Corvettes, the Kawasaki supercharged motorcycle. Well, we're slowing it down just a little bit today. This is what you call a GOG. Good old girl, just a nice old car. You know, these are great fun. This is a 1950 Nash uh, Ambassador Custom. And you don't see these on the road anymore. I like the front of this car because it kind of reminds me of my friend Rodney Dangerfield, the comedian. His face kind of looks like the front of this car. Yeah, you, you can see it. You can see it. Big six-cylinder, 238 cubic inch. Uh, Nash was an independent automaker. They went out of business in the mid-50s, but when they were in business, they built some pretty fine automobiles. Now, I know it looks kind of odd to us today, but this was considered... Uh, State-of-the-art styling. This is the Nash Air Flight. Sort of built like an airplane, that was the idea. Streamlined. Uh, I've heard a rumor that Pina Farina was involved in the design of this car. I, I can't quite confirm that. Some people say yes, some people say no, so I don't know. But it certainly looks like it might have some of that. Fastback. It's a big, comfortable car. Well, here, let me show you an ad from... 1951. This is a year later, but it's basically the same here. Take a look. This is the new 1951 Nash Air Flight, built the same way as the modern airliner and streamlined train. Specially designed for greater strength, greater safety, and the smoothest, quietest drive you ever enjoyed, thanks to exclusive Nash Air Flight construction. In a Nash Air Flight, you'll see the world through an undivided sky-wide windshield and enjoy the comfort of Nash's exclusive weather-eye conditioned air system. There's legroom galore and hydromatic drive if you desire it. A spill-proof storage drawer instead of a cluttered glove compartment. And there's economy that's amazing in a car so big and luxurious. So before you decide, take an air flight ride in the world's most modern car. The 1951 Nash Air Flight. You know, it looks like a big, heavy automobile, but it only weighs 3,400 pounds, which isn't bad. You'd think it weighs 4,400 pounds, but it's not. It's fairly light, and even though it is only a six, it's 115 horsepower. You know, that was equal to the Buick Straight 8 and some of the other V8s of the period, so it was not a slow car, certainly not a fast car, but not a slow car. Uh, this one has the automatic, 1950 was the first year for an automatic transmission. It's a GM hydromatic they put in these. It was a three-speed on the column. Uh, this one, of course, as I said, it has the automatic, so <laughs> it does make it a little bit slower. But it's a big, comfortable car. Uh, you know, you can buy these for pretty much next to nothing. You know, for some reason, I don't know why these are not as collectible as maybe the Cadillacs or some of the other cars. I think they, nothing on the road looks like this. You know, kids like it because it looks like something from the uh, movie Cars. You know, the big kind of goofy face and the big giant front end and the fast back roof. And it's got the seats fold down into a bed. Here, take a look at this picture. Let me tell you a story behind that. The president of Nash was on a road trip one day. And about midnight, he pulled into a motel. And they wanted $2 a night to stay, $2 to stay in a motel. Well, that's ridiculous. So he went back and he said, I want to design a car that the traveling salesman could sleep in on the road, uh, you know, where, the, where it turns into a bed. In fact, in some models, you came with shades so you could close it off so you could actually sleep in your car on the road and not get that $2 ripoff staying in some fancy motel. Well, of course, this car then became the drive-in king during the 50s and the 60s, you know. Dads wouldn't let their daughters go out with guys who had one of these because the car turned into a bed with obvious results. But uh, that was, that's kind of the cool thing about them. Come on, let's go on. I'll show you the inside. You know, this is just a good, honest old car. It hasn't been restored. It's just been fixed up. I got this from a gentleman named Bill Payton. Uh, I met him at a benefit uh, a number of years ago. Here's his picture. A and sadly, he passed away and his family contacted me and uh, they told me he had some cars. We went out to look and um, I, I, I just couldn't resist it. I just, I just like the honesty of it. It's just a nice old girl. Here, let me show you how advanced this car was back in the day. 
in that commercial you just saw, you saw the giant storage unit right here. Let me open that up. Oh, look at that. That's not, that's, that's bigger than the luggage space in my McLaren. Look at that. And you close this here. There you go. And this is my favorite, the Uniscope. This is only on for a couple of years because it's a bit complicated and expensive. All the gauges are right in here. You've got oil and you've got fuel. You've got temperature and of course your speedometer. Um, I like what they call the weather eye. Weather eye. It just opens a vent. Let's air in or out. Uh, clock. Clock works. I'm missing a horn ring. I have to get this. Uh, this is my favorite. This, here's how you start this car. See, nobody can steal these because this has what they call select O lift starting. You grab the, you put it in neutral. You grab, you select and lift. Ooh, select a lift, yes. Why don't all cars have that? See, you've got the generator and the light goes on when it slows down and there you go. Nice big tube radio. I always like tube radios, they give a nice sound. I can't turn the radio on because then I have to pay music rights when it plays a song. It's very complicated, but trust me. And then when you want to look stylish, you just close this like a giant roll top desk. You've got a nice metal desk, dashboard there. Let me tell you something, you hit your head on that dash, they just hose it off and they sell it to somebody else. That's the way these babies work. Yeah, so. Oh, hell, this is kind of cool. I'm missing, can you see the turn indicator? Let me show you, oh, here you go. You see, it, the blinker is at the end of the stock and I need the, uh, I need the little cap that goes over that. So if anybody has one, let me know. I'll give you a call. Uh, these old hydromatics have no park. You have to use your, your parking brake. Um, roll up windows. And of course, you got to have these. When I was a kid, this is the greatest thing before air conditioning. The vent window, fantastic. Smokers loved them. I think this is a new uh, headliner. I think this was put in some time ago. As I said, this car was fixed up. You know, the great thing about getting old cars here in California is they don't rust. In fact, we're going to take this next door and I'll put it up on the lift and we'll show you, uh, we'll show you what the underside of these, this car is like. It, it's pretty robust. I mean, they're nice driving cars and you can buy these for, you know, five, six, seven thousand dollars. Um, and they're wonderful, wonderful cars because they're bulletproof. These go a hundred thousand miles, no problem. Now, a mistake a lot of people make with these old cars is these are six volt cars. And for some reason, people seem to think six volts aren't enough to start the car and run the car. They did back in the day, in the dead of winter, they always work fine. The big mistake is six volt wire is thicker than 12 volt wire. You can't just get automotive wiring and put it on this car. You need to get six volt wiring so it can carry the current. Uh, when I got this, Someone had altered the starter and put a 12 volt starter on it thinking it would spin it faster, but that doesn't work. Just put it back the way it was done at the factory. These guys went to college, they know what they're doing, and they work fine. And that's what we did here. We converted this, everything back to six volt, and we used the proper six volt wire uh, when we did the electrical. We haven't had any problems at all. Um, here's something kind of cool about this engine. Have you noticed right here, this is called a sealed in head and water heated. Uh, this is only on the ambassador. It's like an aluminum bolt-on plate here. And the idea was by altering the plate, you could add more or less carburation if you wanted to. That's uh, kind of cool. Another interesting thing is this single exhaust system. See how it starts here? And it goes all the way around the engine. It's held by just these U-clamps, the only thing to hold it. And there's no gaskets. That's bolted directly onto the engine there. Uh, a big mistake people make is sometimes they over tighten these and they warp them. But if you, if you seal them down good, uh, they don't leak. They work pretty good. Let's bring it next door. We'll put it up on the lift and we'll show you what it looks like underneath. All right, here's what I love about California cars like this. Uh, with the exception of a new exhaust system, which we put in, everything seems to be pretty much original. Um, I don't believe this car was ever restored, just cleaned up. But of course, in this California climate, you get a little bit of rust, but over 64 years, that's not bad. That's not bad. As you see, there's our new exhaust system. We got this from Walgren's, I think, is the guy that does these. He does all these uh, vintage uh, exhaust systems. He has the original plans and he makes them up for you, so that's kind of cool. As you can see, you have a torque tube that drives 
the rear wheels here. These are really stout, strong cars. There's your bulletproof hydromatic transmission. Up front is your independent suspension, unequal A-arms, coil springs, tubular shocks. Uh, the only ambassador had the, uh, the uh, anti-roll bar in front. You notice the shocks are inside the coil springs. A lot of mechanics hated that because it made it harder to work on, but I think it rode better. Um, and look at this. See the kind of, all these holes here? That was sort of done to, uh, to lighten uh, the overall front and weight of the car, but they say it increased wind drag, so I don't know, but that's, that's what I read. The brakes are nothing to write home about. They're 10-inch they're drum brakes, which is typical of the period. When you drive a car like this, you try to use, uh, uh, I use uh, what they call anti-crash technology. You just sort of try to avoid stuff, really. But actually, it stops pretty good. I mean, you'll get brake fade, obviously, of course. But it's not bad. If you drive it the way it was intended, they're actually fine. They're actually fine. But this, like I said, this is what you call a good old girl. It's, I mean, it's, as you can see, this hasn't been restored, all this, what's left of your undercoating. Torque tube. The rear ends in these last about two or 300 miles. Not much you have to do there. As you see, it's pretty straightforward and easy to work on. Well, it's probably time to take it for a ride and see how she goes. Come on. Although I would have preferred the uh, three-speed column shift with the overdrive, you know, this GM Hydromatic is one of the world's greatest transmissions. And at the time it came out, it was the greatest transmission in the world. I mean, four-speed, smooth, shift very nicely. You know, there's something about driving these cars. When I was seven years old, my dad had a 57 Plymouth, and he would let me sit in his lap and hold the steering wheel. And that's what you feel like when you're driving this thing. The car is so huge, the wheel is so big, you feel like a kid, you know, driving your dad's car, just kind of hanging out at the wheel. Maybe that's why I like the nostalgia feel and look of these automobiles. Plus, another thing is, you know, everybody collects 55, 56, 57 Chevys, 55 T-Bird. You know, there's so many of those kind of cars around. You just don't see many of these. And they're, they really are unique and different. But I think the thing that really killed a lot of these independents was they didn't have a V8 until it was too late. You know, General Motors just overpowered the industry with their fabulous overhead valve V8s for the Cadillac and across the 265 Chevy. And as I said before, this six cylinder, even though it had more horsepower than the Buick Straight 8, it was the six versus an eight. You always felt like you were getting something extra with the eight, you know. Same reason, get a five speed instead of a four speed. Even if the final overdrive is the same, you feel like you're getting a little bit more with the five speed. It's like how much space there is. <laughs> it's not unusual to find a Kia or a Hyundai crushed up under the wheel well. I like how much room you have. You can actually wear a hat. Lincoln could drive this car. Look at this. You know what I like about these cars? Everything has a mechanical feel to it. There's no power steering, there's no power brake, so everything is kind of nicely weighted. You always know where the car is at all times. I mean, it's not that it handles great, but it doesn't handle bad. It just handles honestly. You know, you can you just go around, you hit the tires, kind of, yee, 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 yee. okay, okay, thank you. I know I'm going a little too fast. You know, that uh, cross ply tire chirp. I'm not going to catch that bike. You know, that's a pretty active uh, Nash club. The guys that own these things that are in the club are fanatical about them because they really are dependable cars. You can take them anywhere and your average shade tree mechanic can actually fix these and work on it, you know? Everything is right there, easily accessible. And that aerodynamic styling, you just feel it cheating the wind. I mean, I drove this thing a lot during the summer, and I got hotter than the car did. Uh, you know, it doesn't overheat. Nice big radiator. I know it doesn't seem like it, but this was groundbreaking styling back in the day. Hudson also with the Hudson Hornet. Once you get over 60, 65 miles an hour, the aerodynamics really come into play. Take it on one of those new super highways that's just starting to build here in America and see how it cruises. It 
says in the brochure, climbs hills in a jiffy. I'm not sure what a jiffy is, but it seems to be doing it just fine. Well, as you can see, it's getting to be nightfall. And sure, I could blow two bucks and stay in some fancy hotel, but why not do it the Nash way? Let's see me blowing two bucks. Ugh. See you guys next week.